Our next speaker is a woman whose dedication to the sacredness of life and reweaving indigeneity into community is legendary. There is a saying in Iroquois country, if you want something done, get a Mohawk to do it. There, there is no better living proof of this than Gudgee Cook. Gudgee is indeed a member of the Mohawk Nation, one of the six nations of the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois Six Nations Confederacy. Her community of Akwesasne straddles northern New York, uh, southwestern Quebec, and southeastern Ontario. This is an important but little known fact. In the mid-1800s, when early suffragettes in upstate New York looked for examples of where women's perspectives were valued, they found their inspiration in the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois Six Nations. In Sisters in Spirit, Sally Roche Wagner describes many of the ways that Haudenosaunee culture is designed to maintain a balance of equality between women and men. In their culture, the women of the Longhouse are responsible for selecting their chiefs. After observing the boys carefully through their young lives, to see which of them embodies the characteristics needed for leadership. The women also have the power to revoke the chief's title and authority if they feel he's not serving the community well. <laughs> Seems like a good idea to me. <laughs> Unleashing the potential that exists within the North American indigenous world is the impetus behind Gudgy Cook's lifelong work. After decades of connecting people, purpose, and initiatives, she is renowned especially for two related reasons. She has been the most important visionary leader in the revitalization of traditional Native American midwifery and is one of the earliest and most influential researchers on environmental health impacts on indigenous people. Among other achievements in the realm of childbirth, Gudgee, who is herself the mother of five and grandmother of 11, co-founded the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives of the Canadian Association of Midwives of Canada. She was the founding Aboriginal midwife of the Six Nations Birthing Centre in Ontario and has been honored by her colleagues to present the North American keynote for the June 2017 International Confederation of Midwives Conference in Toronto, Canada. Gudgy has also been a leading local, national, and international activist working at the intersections of environmental health and justice and reproductive health and justice at the tribal and federal levels. Gudgy brings a unique perspective to environmental justice drawing from her people's longhouse tradition, which views the woman as the first environment. In 1981, she initiated the famous Akwesasne Mother's Milk Project, which launched groundbreaking, highly influential studies on PCB and heavy metals contamination in her community. But we've invited Gudgie here this year to talk about a major new chapter in her already illustrious career. Gudgie is currently a program director at Novo Foundation, where she has been charged with designing and operationalizing a program to support the leadership of North American indigenous girls and women. This is part of Novo's Indigenous Communities Initiative that exists to support indigenous community-led work in exploring the relationship between and among five things. Harm to Mother Earth and violence against women and girls, that's one. Indigenous cultural expression. Indigenous education and language immersion. Healing from historical trauma and the oppressions of the boarding school era and the leadership of North American indigenous women and girls. These priority areas are congruent to the calls to action delineated by Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, on which Gudgy currently serves as a member of their Elder Advisory Committee. 
Yeah, really. <laughs> and founded by Jennifer and Peter Buffett, Novo Foundation is a philanthropic organization dedicated to catalyzing a transformation in global society, moving from a culture of domination and exploitation to one of collaboration and partnership, investing in women and girls as the primary agents of change. It's hard to imagine more timely and important work or a better person to take it on. Please join me in welcoming the legendary, the amazing Gudgy Cook. This painted in beaded hide that appears in the background of this frame embodies the spiritual power of maize, or honeste, what is commonly called corn. And the standing stalk, or the spine running down the center, represents the spine of leadership in balance. I begin with this image because it serves as a visual prayer and acknowledgement of the renewal of our communities through the life and spirit of the maize, which in Mohawk is called honaste, the sacred covering of the male and female presence, from whose spirit we learn the art of reproduction of bodies and culture and the art of midwifery. This quote from Yvette Collin, president of the Sacred Healing Circle that works to preserve the ancient Native American horse through its spirit horse preservation program. Along my journey, I realized that the world has done a great deal to separate women from one another, so much that the healing occurs when opportunities are presented that helps us to see that we're not isolated and that women share the same experiences and feel similarly about them. Once we realize this, we can decide to make changes, demand changes. The leadership program aims to strengthen the capacity of indigenous communities to address pressing systemic problems and oppressions through investing in and elevating the inherent power of the undervalued assets of North American indigenous women and girls. This patterned flight behavior of starlings reveals that individual birds in flight coordinate their movements based on observations of the six to seven birds around them, calling to mind Malcolm Gladwell's six degrees of separation elucidated in his book, The Tipping Point. Bioneers loves biomimicry, but these patterns are based in physical laws, not biology. At a recent visit to Mato Tipila, Bears Lodge, I learned that the six-sided columns created by natural forces working on this sacred site are the strongest structures in nature. And here are more examples uh, uh, in nature of this preference for the six-sided structure. Uh, Darwin in the 1800s wrote about the bees and their heptagons as the most efficient use of resources and storage. And so this model of community health governance is one of the literatures on which we base our thinking in establishing the design of a leadership program because it speaks to the extent to which people in a community are able to realize their aspirations, satisfy their needs, and cope with their environment. Beginning in August of 2016, we worked with an outfit called Netcentric Campaigns in Washington, D.C., because they have more than 15 years' experience in building advocacy networks. They believe that there are seven elements that make networks powerful and that the fundamental first step to building a network poised for action is building strong bonds between the people in the network. And in, 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 in fact, that is the underpinning of the community health governance model of individual empowerment, building social ties, 
and in that context, synergy emerges. Before we could build a network for the leadership program, we knew we needed to better understand the universe of existing connections between indigenous women. The wisdom and energy for a movement is at the edges. So we needed to push to figure out where the edge of activists are, how they're connected to each other, and how we could support them. So in two national gatherings held in the past year, we put out a request for names to a cohort of about 43 women, asking each of them to submit the names and contact information for 10 of their most trusted uh, connections, much like the starlings and the strength of the six or seven. And so the inc deeper inquiry into those uh, next surface of 10 connections times 43 initial contacts, we began to deepen our inquiry into the landscape of indigenous women and girls. And so uh, it, it was also partnered by a digital, digital scan of social media sites like Facebook, Tumblr, and others. What do these connections look like? Netcentrics did a digital scan that looked at context, content across websites supporting indigenous women's movement. And here's a different type of map that you likely can't read, but the story that this reflects is the connection between websites of organizations serving indigenous women and, and children. Of the websites shared, we analyzed which sites linked to others. The largest cluster found was around the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center in Lame Deer, Montana, with, 50 other with 55 other uh, people linked to this site. Some sites are isolated, like littlewound.us and bia.gov. No surprise with bia.gov. And finally, we looked at conversations across social media, the social media connections. Where are North American indigenous people going to talk about topics related to violence around uh, women and violence against the earth, as well as cultural expression, indigenous language immersion, historic, historic trauma and intergenerational transmission of that trauma from the boarding school era and other dominations and oppressions against indigenous peoples of North America. A lot of recent conversation emerged around Standing Rock, which has drawn international media attention. Conversations primarily on Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter were documented. In one 24-hour period, there were 14,000 conversations related to Standing Stone Camp to the topic on at Facebook, compared to about 500 on all other social media outlets combined in the same 24-hour period. Here is a first glimpse of the universe of connections among indigenous women across the United States and Canada. We ask the women to share the names of people they lean on for support in the areas of violence against women and the priority areas of Novo's Indigenous Communities Initiative. We really only expected to get around 100, but uh, in total we were connected to almost 400 women. So we know that the universe is much bigger, deeper, and more connected than we can see today, much like the stars in the universe. However, our original suspicion that there are a lot of small clusters and a lack of strong connections was confirmed by these initial results. From this information, we see that there is a relatively low degree of connectedness across the movement. Only 43 women were named more than once out of nearly 400 women. Relationships are fluid and can never be fully expressed 
by a straight line. The goal of this work was to be intentional in the way we strengthen a network that empowers women at the edges, to open new connections for them, and to do things to build a movement. So we know that leadership is an emergent property of a network and balance. This is a quote that was taken from a newsletter by Rockwood Institute, and the author I couldn't quote, uh, cite, so I uh, urge you to dig into Rockwood Leadership Institute's materials online. But this notion of the charismatic leader is something that is an essential understanding and practice that we need to build into movement. That this idea, like the starlings and the connections of the six immediately around you, are the real source of leadership. And certainly in my own life cycle, my accomplishments depended on many such connections. And I acknowledge them, among them uh, uh, all of my relatives. So opportunities to join together without judgment to do good things are only helpful. Those leaders who have learned to walk in a good way need help to get in front of these women and girls to offer their wisdom and support. And so here's an example of some of the work that we look forward to in supporting the work of indigenous women and girls. Here is a scene from the culminating moment of a puberty rite in my community called Oharlogo, where we ritualize our youth in a four-year cycle uh, that can go beyond as they come back to the first year of initiates and support them in their development and their growth. We provide, like the corn, the husk, layers of protection education, information, safety. Thinking uh, as our co-president at Novo, Jennifer Buffett, has expressed that children need to feel safe, to feel acknowledged, and to be celebrated. And so in order for these teachings, these learnings, these experiences, these connections that you're feeling here as a participant in Bioneers. Maybe it's your first time here. Maybe you've been here every year since the beginning. I want to ask you to participate with me in an exercise so that these things can take blossom, take root in your heart and in your spirit. And so like the previous elder, of this morning, I ask you to relax in your seat where you are. Fix that wedgie. <laughs> Get comfortable. You might want to take four deep breaths into your belly. Centering yourself inside of your own spirit, inside of the four directions of your own being, closing your eyes, knowing that I'm not here to entertain you, but to guide you to this sacred space in each and every one of us. I'm going to share with you a song that is sung at the American Horse Afraid of Bear Sundance when the morning star rises on the horizon about 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. The most sacred moment when all of the earth stands still. These words sung in Lakota and these words in this song comes from our uncle LaRue Afraid of Bear are to acknowledge the sacredness of that moment where anything is possible. And so the words uh, mean a vision of the morning star, the, the morning star standing on the horizon all over the world. Look at it. Hold this morning close. Oh, 
Thank you, Grandmother, the earth. You love the people. Thank you, Grandfathers, the sun, the rock. You know the way. You love the people. Neto, thank you 